maybe we can start now. Yep, I think we can start. Yeah. So good afternoon, good evening, good night to everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to open the event Care, Russia, Ukraine and the West. And I would like to start with uh, introducing my co-organizer, Professor Irina Vushko. She's assistant professor of history and she's a specialist on Eastern Europe. She's written two monographs. One is already published and another is in, in, in process. And my name is Ekaterina Pravilova. I'm a professor of history at Princeton University and I am a specialist on Bureau Russia. Um, Irina and I, as well as thousands of people around the world were deeply troubled and concerned by recent events on the Russo-Ukrainian border and in Belarus and the concentration of Russian military forces and the aggra aggressive rhetoric of Russian state propaganda. Recent diplomatic actions undertaken by President Biden, Macron and Chancellor Scholz have given some hope in the possibility of diplomatic solution, but the future still looks very unclear and various media outlets in Russia and Ukraine and the United States are offering conflicting interpretations of events and scenarios. Therefore, we wanted to invite experts and discuss what has happened, what is happening now, and if, if possible, what is going to happen. Is this an informational war, the war for attention, the political attention, or is it is a real war is already taking place? Are there any other factors in addition to the only fact that everyone knows name uh, Vladimir Putin? So I will giving floor to Irina who will introduce our distinguished speakers today and just a little bit about the, uh, the logistics of this event. Uh, the audience is invited to ask questions uh, through the Q&A uh, function on Zoom, you see the button, the button on, on the on the bottom of your screen, and don't please don't use the chat function. Uh, your Q&A is the best way to ask a question. We're going to read the question to the speakers after they introduce, uh, after they give our short uh, introductory remarks. Ira? Well, thank you. Um... So my name is Irina Vushko. Thank you very much for the introduction. I would like to mention that this event is sponsored by the Princeton program in Russian, East European and Eurasian studies. And uh, our program administrator Carol uh, has been <laughs> immensely efficient, very helpful, and she's not visible here, but she's always behind the scene. And I would like to uh, thank her, to thank her specifically uh, very much for that. And just one more technical detail. Um, this this event is being recorded. So and the recording, the video and audio recording will be posted on at uh, on the center website. You can also join our Facebook. You can also sign up for our Facebook, and there are all the different updates as well as recording of the previous events. And it's our pleasure to, in my pleasure to introduce several speakers and I'm very grateful that people actually join. I know uh, all of us have busy schedule and especially some of you have been doing this for a while now. Uh, the first to speak is Nolan Peterson um, who's joining us from Kyiv. Uh, he's a former US uh, uh, Special Forces uh, operation pilot and a veteran of uh, the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. He's, a, he's also a journalist and currently a senior editor of the coffee, uh, for Coffee or Bee magazine. Uh, excuse me if I mispronounce it. Um, he authored a book, Why Soldiers Miss the War. Um, he's here, obviously, not because of his experience in Afghanistan, but because of his involvement in Ukraine. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm particularly grateful for the, everything that Nolan has done in Ukraine. I think this, he's, he's provided one of the best coverage and really, you know, I'm very grateful for the way, how much he cares. And he's now in Kiev. He's joining us from Kiev, and it's late night in Kiev. Uh, so I'm, I'm very grateful for that too. And our other speaker is also in a, in a time zone which is even later than Kiev. Uh, joining us from Moscow, uh, Mikhail Fishman is a journalist, editor, and a TV presenter. He's been in journalism in Russia since the 19th, since the 90s, covering political scene. Um, he's a former editor and chief of the Russian Newsweek and the Moscow Times. He's currently. Um, working as an anchor of the TV um, Rain or Dost independent uh, television network and to my understanding the only independent or semi-independent television network in Russia. He's also a uh, co-authored the book The Man Who Was um, to Free, uh, a documentary feature uh, 
on Boris Nemtsov, not the book, but a documentary feature on Boris Nemtsov, who is a major Russian opposition leader. Olena Lenon was a conspicuously non-Ukrainian or non-Russian name, but uh, was roots to Donetsk, in, which is now God knows what, but former Ukraine of occupied territories. But she's joining us from actually Connecticut, from New Haven. She's an adjunct professor of political science and good, good friend. So I can, you know, I can, I can, I can say a few things too. Uh, an adjunct professor of political science at the University of New Haven. She's where she teaches courses on U.S. foreign and defense policy. I mean, she's joining us here not because of her expertise on on international U.S. policy, but because of her roots to Ukraine and specifically Donetsk, right? So not there are not many people who can talk with some of expertise, um, both like a personal perspective and expertise on that region. And so Nolan will start us off. Um, the way that we proceed, uh, we'll start off with short presentations, hopefully ten minutes presentation. So we, you'll give us hopefully plenty plenty time of discussion for discussion. So Nolan will start us off. Will start us off. Michael Fishman will go after him, and um, Lena um, Lennon will join them afterwards. And thank you very much, Nolan. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you. Uh, first of all, it's a it's a real honor to speak to such a prestigious group and to be joined by such uh, noteworthy panelists. I'll make one quick alibi. Uh, my wife just left the country, so I'm uh, a single cat father at the moment. <laughs> so if you see a, a cat wonder by the screen, uh, don't be alarmed. And I'll probably be a YouTube celebrity here if this is being recorded. <laughs> um, so just yesterday, I was at a military training event here in Kyiv where a couple of American army veterans, one from Iraq and one from Afghanistan, uh, were using lessons that they had learned in fighting an insurgency to train Ukrainian civilians to wage one against a prospective Russian occupation force. And I have to be honest, it was quite surreal to observe these everyday Ukrainians aging from 13 years old to 60 running combat drills in the snow, preparing to defend their hometown street by street if they have to. It's hard to believe that such a thing is possible today, the year 2022. But this has been the reality for many Ukrainians now for nearly eight years of war. And based on the most recent Russian troop movements, the buildup phase of this confrontation is coming to an end and the waiting game has begun. Tomorrow, Russia begins 10 days of war games in Belarus. And today, the news was announced that Russia is shutting down large portions of the Black Sea and most of the Sea of Azov for so-called missile exercises. After building up its military forces on Ukraine's borders for months, Russia already has most of the hardware in place to launch a major military operation on short notice. And the last piece of the puzzle has been the transfer of troops, actual human beings, to complement much of that pre-positioned military equipment. And we are now seeing those troop transfers occur. Most troubling is the transfer of Russian National Guard units near Ukraine's borders. And those units would presumably be used as part of an occupation force not an offensive invasion force. The bottom line is that Russia now has enough military firepower massed on Ukraine's borders to execute, execute some sort of military operation at any time. And within about a week, Russia may have the pieces in place to execute the worst case scenario, which would be a countrywide invasion by about 100 Italian tactical groups from multiple vectors including an encirclement of Kyiv, likely preceded by waves of airstrikes and missile attacks meant to inflict massive and irrecoverable losses on Ukraine's military. And many people believe that the overall objective of such an operation would be to change the government here in Kyiv. The ongoing conflict in the Donbass has killed about 14,000 people over eight years. And the kind of war we're looking at now could kill that many people in a matter of days. At this point, in my estimation, to believe that this is all a bluff is an act of faith. 
The evidence clearly points to the fact that Russia is preparing for a major military operation. Whether the command to go has been given or not is up is still something to debate, but the evidence is clear that Russia is ready for a much wider and much deadlier war, and we should treat this threat seriously. Although most Ukrainians were initially skeptical about the likelihood of a major offensive this winter, the mood has shifted, and many people believe that a wider war is possible, and they're doing concrete things to get ready. Here in Kyiv, I've interviewed countless people who are making plans to either flee the city, to build up supplies, to weather out a siege at home, or to take up arms to and to defend their hometowns as part of a territorial defense unit, perhaps, or a resistance unit. In fact, my 57-year-old father-in-law, my 59-year-old uncle-in-law, who are both Soviet Army veterans of the Afghanistan era, have joined territorial defense units to defend their hometowns. In my recent reporting, I've used the word limbo quite a bit. And that word not only applies to the Ukrainian civilians, it also applies to this country's more than 430,000 combat veterans of the Donbass War, many of whom belong to Ukraine's first operational reserve, which could be mobilized within 24 hours uh, to return to active duty. I recently interviewed one veteran of the Donbass War who showed me his veteran's suitcase laid out on the ground in his apartment, basically all the gear he has ready uh, to you know, grab a sack and go report for duty within 24 hours if the order to mobilize is given. Now, coming home from war is tough on any man or woman who has served, especially if your war isn't over yet. And Ukrainian veterans now have the added burden of knowing that on 24 hours notice, they may have to kiss their family goodbye, throw in a uniform, grab a gun, and go face down a Russian invasion. But the mood here in Kyiv and across Ukraine is far from panic. I was recently at Ukraine's three-way border with both Russia and Belarus. And I have to say the situation there seemed, at least hourly, quite calm. But the Ukrainian border guard troops were being extremely cautious about not doing anything or acting in a way that Russia could interpret as, as, a, you know, as a propaganda pretense, perhaps, uh, to exploit, to launch a wider war. And for its part, the Ukrainian nation, I think, is giving the world a masterclass on how a democratic society should act in a moment of crisis. Here in Kyiv, civilian volunteer groups are teaching civilians uh, combat first aid, how to pack go bags, how to find the nearest bomb shelter, how to take care of children in a combat environment. And like I said, many civilians are now joining territorial defense units or resistance units uh, planning to defend their, home, their hometowns uh, as part of a nationwide resistance war. In short, just like when the war began in 2014, Ukrainians are not waiting for the government to save them in this moment of crisis. And I have no doubt that if the Ukrainian military is defeated on the field of battle, the Ukrainian people will carry on the fight. But I have to say that a nationwide resistance movement, however inspiring it is, may not be effective against a major conventional Russian blitz comprising air power and armored tank columns rolling in. And I worry about the catastrophic human toll of a nationwide insurgency. The recent surge in lethal military weapons from the US, the UK, and other NATO allies certainly sends a strong message of solidarity to Ukraine's civilians. And that material will make a difference on the battlefield for the Ukrainians. However, with the Russian offenses now perhaps a week away or several weeks away, it is too late for more advanced weapons from the West, like Patriot missiles, to make a measurable impact in Ukraine's ability to repel a Russian invasion particularly when it comes to a air campaign and the threats from the air. At this point, I think we should be also focusing on a concerted effort to prepare for a humanitarian disaster of historic proportions if Russia invades. We could potentially have millions of refugees in the dead of winter. Ukrainians have the will to fight, and they've already proven that. 
And Western support in any form, whether through diplomatic gestures or weapons deliveries, it sends a strong message to Ukraine's soldiers and civilians that they haven't been forgotten and that their dreams of democracy and freedom are still worth fighting for. And I think that's a message that the whole world needs to hear. And to end with a quote by my favorite author, uh, Ernest Hemingway, he wrote, if we win here, we will win everywhere. And I can't think of a better way to explain why Ukraine matters to the US, Europe and NATO and to democracies all around the world. Thank you very much, Nolan. Um, and thank you for being so concise. You know, it's exactly 10 minutes. You know, this is a professional at work. Uh, I'm a pilot. I'm <laughs> yeah, well, we appreciate it. You know, yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, next, uh, Mikhail Fishman, who is from Moscow. It's a very late night uh, in Moscow. And um, so please welcome Mikhail Fishman. Uh, yes, well, thank you very much for having me here at this uh, wonderful um, uh, um, panel and thank you Nolan for such a presentation of what the mood and what's going on actually in in Kiev. Um, Nolan has just, uh, uh, first of all, I um, please excuse me for my English. I haven't practiced it for several months already, uh, but I will try my best. Uh, um, and what uh, Nolan has exposed is, uh, I'd say probably the worst case scenario of what might uh, might happen. And uh, his point is that um, it is possible and um, Russia's military is technically ready to carry such, uh, such a, an offensive, such an attack. Um, I, uh, I will, I will, um, um, I will uh, just say a few words on uh, basically how it started and uh, um, to uh, will um, go with a short sort of historical trip on how uh, Putin treats uh, Ukraine, the issue of Ukraine and how central it is for uh, Vladimir Putin, because I don't think that everybody understands that by now. Uh, that's why I'm also pessimistic, though I certainly hope that, uh, that we will avoid that kind of humanitarian catastrophe that Nolan has just described. Um, the usually, well, basically during this crisis in its, um, um, uh, well, almost hot phase for a few months, two months already, uh, there is a major question, what is going on? Why uh, Vladimir Putin has escalated so dramatically? Um, and um, why this unprecedented military buildup uh, on, the, on the borders of Ukraine and why Moscow, the Kremlin, Vladimir Putin himself is clearly threatening to start uh, a war. There are several answers, or maybe maybe he is tries to reconstruct the world order. Maybe it's about European new, I don't know, something new uh, shape, new forms of European security, something else. But I'm uh, positive that it's all about Ukraine, and. Uh, I'll just want to offer this short explainer uh, of how it started and why uh, the, um, the U Ukraine actually haunts uh, Putin from basically the very start of his uh, rule, which started almost 20 years ago. So this already, th this question is this, this problem, this issue is 20 years old, almost 20 years old, or even Basically, we are in two, uh, 2022, it's already 20 years old. Um, so uh, I'll just uh, mm, remind you how it, how it started. Uh, Putin becomes president in 2000. And uh, the, the next year, 2001, basically, maybe early 2002, he um, raises the question of uh, Russia's uh, zone of influence outside its borders. Um, with um, he starts he he starts this um, uh, project of so-called Eurasian economic community, which uh, um, had to be formed by former Soviet states, Russia, and former Soviet states, such as uh, primarily not um, not only but primarily uh, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and of course Ukraine. It was unthinkable 
without, uh, without Ukraine. And I want also to remind you that at that time, early 2000s, um, Ukraine's leader, Leonid Kuchma, Ukraine's president, uh, tries to play this sort some kind of double game. Uh, he, at the same time, declaring Ukraine's path to NATO and playing with the idea of this economic union with Russia and trying to, um, to play on two boards simultaneously. Um, and uh, so from, from Moscow's perspective, at this time, early 2000s, Ukraine is already at crosshairs of this sort of geopolitical battle between, between Russia and the West, just from that very, from the, that very time. And what happens next is that by um, what is also very important that by uh, fall 2003, early 2004, late 2003, um, Vladimir Putin um, makes his uh, authoritarian turn at home in Russia. Basically by the end of 2003, um, every um, major political actor, parties, political institution is under his control, under his personal control. Business, he, he, he just jailed, um, by the end of 2003, he just jailed um, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, which was a major issue in uh, how Russia sees itself in, in the future. And it just happened that at that very time, uh, this uh, ability of uh, Ukrainian leadership to play, the, uh, to play this, uh, a double game on two boards simultaneously, uh, Kuchma's ability uh, to maneuvering between Russia and the West uh, comes to its end because of the upcoming presidential election in, uh, in which the issue of what happens next and where Ukraine will go, um, this question becomes central. And uh, Ukraine as a nation uh, has to choose between two, um, two candidates, the um, Viktor Yushchenko, um, uh, pro-Western leader representing the West and the Central uh, Ukraine, and uh, Viktor Yanukovych, who uh, comes from Donetsk, who represents the East, uh, Kuchma's, Leonid Kuchma's pick, and um, heavily uh, backed uh, by Moscow and by, by Vladimir Putin. And Vladimir Putin invests heavily in his presidential campaign. We're already in 2000, early 2004, let's say. So 2004, the year is 2004. So for, uh, for Putin, 2004 is already this some kind of decisive point. Ukraine has to elect Yanukovych and to choose to stay with Russia, to be under Russia's, in Russia's zone, zone of influence. That's how he sees this uh, the, the, this picture. We know what was next. Yanukovych's camp during the election rigs the outcome of the election. Then the so-called Orange Revolution starts and Viktor, Viktor Yushchenko becomes uh, Ukraine's um, president. And that's how Putin suffers his first major loss. And for him, this story in 2004, the Orange Revolution is crystal clear. The West stole Ukraine from right under his nose. That's how he sees uh, things. And uh, that's when his perception of Ukraine, his, um, um, his and Russia's leadership, his, his inner circle, him pers his personal, uh, his perception of Ukraine as a, as a non-state, as a failed state, uh, which has been taught, torn away from, from Russia by the West, starts to uh, take uh, take its sort of current shape and oc occupy his uh, his mind becomes his uh, mm, some kind of obsession since since then uh, he never for, he never forgets this loss and never abandons the idea of bringing Ukraine back to where he thinks it belongs uh, to under under Moscow's control uh, he keeps playing Ukraine's political uh, on Ukraine's political scene Orange Revolution as we know. Uh, collapsed. Yanukovych has become first, uh, first becomes um, prime minister, then is elected as uh, Ukraine's president. And then history starts going sort of in circles because uh, we are now already, to make the story short, in 2012, 2013, Vladimir Putin is back to, 
in the Kremlin as um, uh, after Medvedev's uh, era, short era, short um, Thor era, um, uh, Thor in, rela with, in relationship with the West, is back as Russia's president and his agenda, and he's back with his agenda um, to build a pro-Russian zone um, along Russian, Russian borders. And he needs Ukraine again to join uh, his, um, what it's called, uh, uh, Eurasian Union. Uh, and the, but what, is, what is important is customs union that uh, Ukraine, as he thinks, has to enter. But uh, in 2013, Yanukovych is heading a totally opposite direction. In order to win his next uh, presidential election, he, um, he wants Ukraine to uh, join economic association with the European Union. So um, in fall 2013, Putin forces Yanukovych to change his choice and to reject this European, uh, Ukraine's European choice and to reject this uh, association with, with the EU. And that's when Yanukovych makes his sudden U-turn. Uh, and that's how second uh, revolution starts, uh, Euromaidan, so-called Euromaidan, which this time for real and, uh, uh, and in, in few months, by February 2014, uh, in, it turns into a full-scale scale, uh, armed rebellion, uh, what Putin would uh, call later as coup d'etat, backed by, by, by the West. And uh, that's when Putin takes Crimea and starts the war in Donbass uh, with its, as, as Nolan just uh, said, 14, uh, 14 uh, hundred thousand uh, casualties already. Uh, so this is already his second. Uh, he did take um, Crimea, he did start the war in Donbass, but it's his at the same time, it's his second loss of the same battle because his bet was that Yanukovych will, uh, will make his turn and bring Ukraine back. And it never happened. So he, that's the only area uh, during all his political life that he experienced such uh, big losses, um, consequent. Um, so you, Ukraine be becomes a really uh, crucial issue. And um, Putin never gave up, gave up since then. Uh, he, the, well, what's also very important is the, the more he stays, the longer he stays in power, the more authoritarian becomes his rule and the more uh, the issue of Ukraine be, uh, um, turns into obsession. It's also extremely important to understand. So um, we know that his idea was to, in, uh, during last several years, was to implant Donbass back into Ukraine on his own terms so that, uh, again, uh, he would be controlling uh, Ukraine's path through um, incorporated Donbass region. Uh, and uh, now we mm, come to, um, now, now, now we see that he starts, starts, he already understood or started to uh, see that this pl plan is also failing. Um, he probably relied on uh, Zelensky when he was uh, elected president that it would be easier uh, to, to convert uh, with him, but uh, it, ne it never happened. So he decided by now, uh, somehow during this, this year, that um, time has come to, uh, to go big and to up the ante. And um, either Ukraine is delivered uh, to him uh, by the West, or he takes it by force. That's how things look uh, from, 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 from today. That's, uh, but, and that's how we got uh, to where we are uh, at, the, at the moment. Uh, so it just, I wanted to say that it started 20 years ago. And by now, it's basically probably the only uh, real point in Vladimir Putin's uh, agenda. He, the economy is uh, failing. Uh, uh, Russia, Russia, in, in, in Russia, he has no other way to go, actually, uh, other than to rebuild, try to rebuild the empire. And, uh, and Ukraine is crucial. So that's what makes, I think, 
this uh, whole situation extremely dangerous. Yeah, thank you so much, Mikhail, for this uh, um, amazing, excellent overview, historical overview, historical and psychological overview of the, the roots of contemporary uh, crisis. And now, we'll, uh, Alena Lennon. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you, Ira and Katya, for organizing this, and um, Nolan and, and Mikhail for your wonderful remarks. Um, I want to echo what uh, Mikhail just said um, in terms of uh, Putin's sort of uh, civilizational interest in, in Ukraine. Um, but I also, I, as much as it might be tempting to reduce Moscow's interest in Ukraine to economic and geopolitical interests um, and security concerns, um, I think that um, it's, it's beyond that, right? So the language of the past 20 years had signaled uh, much bigger interest, uh, ontological identity interest in Ukraine, if you will, uh, where Ukraine occupies uh, a central place in, in Moscow's perception of, of the greater Russia um, and of Ukraine's sort of centrality in, um, in restoration of what Putin perceives to be, uh, um, you know, a deservedly Russian place in history to, uh, to control this land. So I think there are deeper identity issues there. Um, and I, 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 be I really believe that um, and the evidence had, had pointed to uh, Putin being quite sentimental about, um, you know, reversing this course of pro-Western integration in Ukraine and reclaiming uh, Ukraine as part of, again, Russia's sort of security zone, but, but also Russia's uh, cultural sphere of influence. Uh, uh, but, you know, I was asked, Ira asked me today to talk about um, uh, Donetsk and, and um, kind of remind people uh, what's going on in um, occupied and in government, uh, non-government controlled territories. Um, and I, I in, you know, I, I was just uh, briefly remind um, the audience here that um, uh, that I'm sure is, is, uh, is not news to anybody, um, what potentially Russian occupation could look like on a larger scale, right? So we already have a sample of, of a, the, the type of uh, you know, pseudo institutions and uh, oppressive regime that currently exists in non-government controlled territories um, that could potentially have um, you know, kind of spillover effect on, on the rest of Ukrainian territory um, were Russia to proceed with what Nolan described as potentially um, a, a more long-term occupation uh, than uh, we could expect even at this time. Um, so I, I would agree um, with, with Nolan that it, it seems as though uh, Russia is staging an occupational force um, and an occupation rather than an invasion. Um, they are uh, or not, not just an invasion, right? They're preparing uh, for uh, a, um, you know, potentially to, uh, to control uh, much of the terrain. You know, they're, they're ready to, uh, for a large scale invasion if, um, if the political objective was to, to decapitate um, regime in Kiev. Um, now, it, it seems more likely now too, uh, given that uh, limited campaigns have in the past have failed to extract concessions from Kiev. Uh, so uh, it, it seems as though uh, the Kremlin might be resorting to what they believe is, is, the, uh, is the only option remaining, is to uh, hold terrain, uh, decapitate uh, the political regime in Kiev um, and um, um, sort of uh, install uh, whatever version of government um, they might have in mind. And this is kind of my, uh, you know, I was asked today to kind of remind people what kind of a government it could be. Um, and, and I think that with the, uh, the so-called republics, um, we have a pretty uh, good idea as to what life under the Russian occupation might look like. Um, it may seem as though those republics sort of kind of have acquired a, a logic of their own uh, those people who were able to leave uh, have left. Um, many people have remained in those um, in, in those um, territories for a variety of reasons. Um, but by now, um, definitely the people's ideologies and views have hardened. Um, and again, the life sort of has acquired a logic of its own and it, it may not be as easy to reintegrate those territories. But I wanted to kind of emphasize a few things um, that um, are currently going on in, in the non-government controlled territories, again, um, because these conversations about, um, you know, the dire economic, environmental, security, uh, public health, human rights conditions uh, that are now proliferating in the 
non-government controlled territories, not to mention uh, what a um, um, sort of lawless land it has become for human trafficking, drug trafficking, and, and other crimes. Um, because, you know, these conversations, I think, have acquired new relevance and importance uh, with, these with the potential invasion and control of populations um, that uh, could be coming, um, you know, in, in a matter of weeks now, uh, if Russia were to, in fact, execute these, this sort of multi-domain operation that, that Nolan spoke about. Um, so, it, you know, and I think it's quite fair to assume that it, that um, so Russia's version of controlling uh, larger territories of Ukraine could in fact resemble the command structure of the current uh, republics um, that are operating as proxies of the Kremlin. Um, so I'm um, just going to remind people briefly what these um, non-government controlled republics um, uh, look like. You know, they're about a third of the Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Um, there is a, approximately 1.5 uh, million people remaining there. Um, they had been increasingly isolated, politically and socially isolated. Um, many are elderly or uh, people, families of the elderly people who have not been able to leave them um, in those um, occupied territories. Um, and you know, COVID-19 obviously has exacerbated the difficulties in traveling across the line of contact. There are, there are a lot of bureaucratic and arbitrary movement restrictions that had been imposed uh, on, on that population to the point where even uh, delivery of, of shipments uh, and, and humanitarian aid um, have been uh, on hold uh, due to these sort of arbitrary restrictions. Um, but you know, most um, in, I think most uh, egregious violations really um, in these republics, as have been reported by the United Nations and many other uh, domestic and international human rights organizations, um, pertain to uh, just massive uh, violations of human rights. Uh, people continue to be illegally detained, imprisoned, tortured for uh, things like criticizing the republics or expressing pro-Ukrainian views on social media. Um, not to mention uh, allegations of spying, um, uh, terrorist activities, and so on and so forth. Uh, people even get arrested for not having DNR and LNR license plates. Uh, so any like minor offenses expressing pro-Ukrainian views or, or questioning um, the legitimacy of the republics uh, gets people arrested, detained, and tortured. Um, and, and we're talking about a, a, a pseudo-regime with uh, pseudo institutions that run a lawless, oppressive um, regime where count countless people have been um, arrested and thrown in prison, um, and the most severe limitations, in fact, um, and uh, uh, severe uh, penalties are levied against people who, in one way or the other, try to uncover the uh, the Russian involvement um, in 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 the administration and and the uh, command structure of of these republics. Um, so, so currently it is estimated that approximately 300 people are currently being held in various basements um, of, you know, that many of which we don't even um, know exact precisely how many people are held there. Uh, there are many secret pre prisons operating um, in these non-government controlled territories. Now it's, 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 it's uh, mind boggling to, to imagine that this is happening um, in Ukraine, you know, in, in 2022, um, on on everybody's watch that you know the again the proliferation of um, torture abuse human trafficking in these non-government controlled territories is astounding. Um, now the political control currently is being enforced by the so-called uh, MGB Ministerstvo Gospodarstva Bezpasnosti, right, the state security um, apparatus that is directed by the FSB, um, Russia's Federal Security Service, the military formations. Um, uh, the, the armed services of, of these republics are commanded by regular Russian military officers. Um, the, uh, the, these republics also contribute uh, not a sizable contingent necessarily, but definitely contribute a combat power uh, to that will augment a potential occupation um, of uh, Russia's conventional forces. Um, so currently, uh, the DNR and LNR's armed forces are organized into the first army corps and the second army corps that collectively um, contribute about thirty-five thousand uh, soldiers. Um, but you know they are. It may not be again a sizable contingent relative to one hundred and thirty-five thousand uh, troops uh, currently. You know already 
arriving and, and uh, manning those formations um, equipment. Um, but you know these, um, these Army Corps are equipped with their own tanks, MRLS, um, uh, artillery systems, and uh, armored vehicles and, and other weaponry, uh, prohibited weaponry, uh, as a matter of fact, um, that will facilitate and augment um, you know, Russia's regular forces. Um, in addition, um, it, it is estimated that uh, there are about additional 2,000 uh, advisors, trainers, um, and other uh, Russian service uh, persons that are supporting uh, logistics, uh, command and control, and, and various other functions. Um, you know, it, it, again, these conversations as far as what's happening in, in these um, non-government controlled territories could be a, a, a preview as to uh, what type of command structure and, and political entities we, we may see manifesting and proliferating um, in, um, in not just in Donetsk and Luhansk, but potentially in other regions of Ukraine uh, and not necessarily in the east and in the south. Again, if, if this were a large-scale operation, that we could see uh, these types of uh, humanitarian, political, environmental disasters metastasizing th throughout the region. Um, and and uh, and, which, and and these are just um, you know more um, I would say tangible outcomes. Uh, but we're not even mentioning the consequences of intergenerational trauma, the psychological trauma inflicted on populations where. I know these you know, people have been traumatized for eight years now, and and it is not lost on Ukrainians uh, what life in those republics is like. So I think um, you know if, uh, if I, I think that Putin really underestimates um, the amount of uh, transformation that the Ukrainian society has undergone because um, he is not likely to meet a captive audience in Ukraine. Uh, not only because of uh, so the revival of Ukrainian identity, but exactly because of, of these egregious crimes uh, and conditions that had been created um, in these, um, you know, basically Russia controlled republics. Um, and life is not good there. And it's not, it's not lost on anybody um, what that could potentially look like in the rest of Ukraine. So much so, in fact, and this is, a, I'll, I'll say that in, in closing too, I know I have about uh, two minutes. Um, that, you know, um, you know, again, we, we have been talking about these uh, uh, conditions in non-government controlled territories for eight years now. And in, in a way, I think people have sort of um, preferred to forget about, you know, what's going on there a little bit, because there's a little bit of a blame shifting going on too, where I know people even in Ukraine sometimes tend to, uh, to talk about residents of occupied territories as you know people who just made their choice right so it, it was they chose the life that they chose and and it's um you know they're now left to their own devices um but i think that um in a kind of further testament to just how egregious these conditions are is the fact that um after a six-year preliminary investigation uh, that the international criminal court had been um conducting in those areas in december of 2020 um, the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court determined in a, in a historic moment for Ukraine, determined that uh, there is reasonable basis to believe that the, a, a range of violations um, in the Donbass area, in fact, constitute war crimes and crimes against humanity. Now that, and, and, and they, um, there is an attempt now to open up a full-blown investigation at the International Criminal Court um, to investigate these as war crimes. And again, this is a quite a historic uh, decision because the International Criminal Court has very limited resources uh, to investigate war crimes around the world. And this level of attention to what's going on in Donbass, I think is just further evidence as to how atrocious uh, conditions are in, in these Russia controlled uh, republics. And again, in closing, I would just say that of particular concern to us should be the, the methods of indoctrination and militarization in the DNR and LNR uh, that are similar to those in Crimea and, and Russia itself, where the, the young population, the children now who, who went to schools and, and educated in, in, in these sort of DNR controlled schools as patriots of uh, these republics and um, you know, pledging loyalty and allegiance to Russia, um, and they're, they're being indoctrinated in a system that presents a very different history of Ukraine and also treats Ukraine as, as an existential enemy. Um, and, and that is, I think, is perhaps one of the more tragic 
uh, consequences of uh, letting sort of these um, these types of political institutions metastasize throughout Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Liana, for this um, uh, excellent overview of the situation in Eastern Ukraine. We are now switching to the Q&A. We have about 45 minutes for questions and answers. We have a lot of questions. So please, all participants, try to be as concise as possible. Um, I will read the questions uh, um, to, the, to the speakers. And I will start with a question from Daria Kiryanov. Uh, yes, just one thing. I, I wanted to remind everyone to use the Q&A function if you want to ask a question, because the chat is mostly for technical issues. So if you have a question, type in the Q&A. Um, Daria Kiryanov is asking, uh, and this is a question to Nolan. Your scenario is certainly incredibly disturbing. If Russia's main purpose in this buildup is to topple the current government in Ukraine, would this not be possible with much less military equipment? Why would such a show of force by Russia be necessary for a coup operation? Also, could you please comment on the actual distance that Russia, Russian troops are from the Ukrainian border? I understand that it's between 100 and 300 miles, depending on the region. Yeah, that's, that's a, a great question. Great pair of questions. Um, you know, I think that, you know, as a, as an outsider who's been in Ukraine for the past eight years, I can say that um, it might sound kind of bizarre to say, but in, in effect, I think the war has unified the Ukrainian people and bolstered this country's democracy and their sense of, you know, independence and freedom and all that to a degree that it never had achieved after the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so I think for, for Russia to attempt to redirect Ukraine or some rump Ukrainian state back under Moscow's control, um, it's going to take more than just a coup, right? Because <laughs> I've already talked to many uh, veterans, activists, everyday citizens who would go out in a heartbeat and overthrow some puppet uh, Moscow regime that was installed uh, in some you know, sort of covert subversion uh, subversive action. So I think for for Russia to achieve its end, if it has, if it truly has the maximalist end of, you know, turning Ukraine back away from Europe and back under its control, then I think it's going to take a major, major military offensive. It's going to take a crushing defeat of Ukraine's armed forces. Um, it's going to take mass chaos. You know, like in the in the absolute anarchy. Of a, of a siege on Kyiv, for example, if there's millions of people fleeing the city or whatever, um, that could be an environment in which Russia could then perhaps install its sort of, you know, proxy government here in, in, in Kyiv. Uh, but I think to achieve that, you're going to need to basically, um, you know, just throw the entire country into chaos. There's, when I was an Air Force pilot, uh, it was there's a, a rule we often cited, which is called the pottery barn rule when we invaded Iraq and Afghanistan, which is you break it, you own it, right? Uh, meaning that we invaded those countries and we were victorious in our invasions. And then we stuck around trying to nation build and all that for a generation. I think if Russia invades Ukraine in the way that you know we all fear might be possible, um, Russia's not going to stick around and own it. They're just going to break it. And they could just leave and just set this country back a generation militarily, politically, culturally. And um, that could be the one objective as well. Uh, so I think it's going to take a major military operation for Russia to achieve that maximalist aim that it's, it's looking for. As far as the distance of those forces toward uh, near Ukraine, one very disturbing trend over the last, I'd say, one to two weeks is we're seeing those units, particularly in Yelnia uh, and Voronezh, that were position several hundred miles away are now consolidating much closer to Ukraine's borders. Um, there's been uh, Russian military movement uh, within about 17 kilometers of the border near Kharkiv and um, the entire 41st combined arms, uh, arms army moved from Yelnia down to a position about 35 kilometers from the Ukrainian border in Senkivka, which is I, the location, that three-way border with Russia and Belarus. Uh, that I had visited uh, just about a week ago. So we are seeing movement of forces kind of like from their long-term staging areas to perhaps staging areas for an immediate action against Ukraine. Um, also, 
we are seeing the transfer of combat aircraft, you know, SU-34s. There were just two TU-122 uh, uh, supersonic bombers that were conducting exercises in Belarus. So you're seeing the forward positioning now of, um, you know, combat aircraft and airstrike assets uh, that would be used in sort of that, that initial attack. Um, so yeah, we are seeing that movement. Again, you know, from Crimea, those units are certainly poised. There's been a big build up there, which has led some to think that there might be a sort of a coordinated attack from the south and from near Kharkiv to perhaps encircle the forces in the Joint Forces Operation Area, which is the war zone in the Donbass. And that would then open up Russia's ability to basically sweep into Kyiv. Um, so short answer, forces are moving closer to the border, particularly air assets. And for yeah. Russia to achieve its maximalist aims, you know, it's going to take a major, uh, a major military operation. And just as one point to, you know, I think what we're going to be looking at here is something similar to Desert Storm. If it happens, using the full force that Russia has to bear, this is going to be a Desert Storm type operation, major air campaign. And as a former pilot, that's the thing that really uh, kind of keeps me up at right at night right now is that Russia, with its Iskander missiles and its airstrike capabilities, has the ability basically within you know, 48 hours to uh, to neutralize or to, you know, to destroy a good deal of Ukraine's military. And I think that's a serious threat. And I, I hope the Ukrainian military is, is, is taking that seriously. Thank you very much. What an optimistic scenario, right, for all of us. <laughs> Hopefully, you know, now we have to like, you know, well, it's, it's a long night for, going to be a long night for some of us. But I think our questions, my questions, uh, and uh, I'll just, you know, I just want to read, uh, just would like to reiterate what uh, Katerina Privilege just said, you know, we have a lot of questions. So I would like to ask both the, you know, the participants and people who ask questions to be as precise and as concise as possible, you know, and we only take one question from one individual, hopefully, you know, within like, if you can formulate it within a sentence or so, right? So we can process more. And so the next questions, and I'll combine two questions to, from two people to Mikhail. So the question from Frederick, uh, Frederick Marcus, and um, I'll cut some of the questions for the sake of time. Um, so question from Frederick, uh, besides getting additional territory, uh, how would Russia benefit from an invasion of Ukrainian territory? And a somewhat similar or overlapping question from Alexandra Volos, um, why has Vladimir Putin or fixated more on, reclaim, on reclaiming Ukraine versus other former, former Soviet states? It's, yeah. Mikhail. Mikhail, you muted. Yep. Yeah. Yes, um, I'll try to be as short as, as, uh, as I can. Um, so it's not, um, uh, it's, not, um, it's not about turning, technically turning Ukraine into, into, in, into Russia, make it Russian um, territory. It's, uh, it's about getting it back uh, under, under Russia's, uh, Russia's control, uh, under Russia's, uh, Russia's influence. Uh, it's... Um, Mm, it's like I don't know. Think about it in 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 uh, uh, I don't know uh, uh, Stalin's terms, like how he was building the Soviet uh, the Soviet bloc. Uh, think of it, uh, or think of pictures uh, of uh, Ukraine, uh, like Polish or Balt Baltic states workers inviting Russian military in their homes, uh, liberating and joining and. Uh, uh, full of full of joy, uh, welcoming them into um, uh, into into their homes. That's the pictures that uh, basically come to mind when we think of uh, how um, Vladimir Putin sees uh, what's going on and how Russian propaganda will be will be playing uh, with uh, if again if this kind of uh, the worst scenario we're talking about. Um, takes place. The problem is that it will be so different from re reality that it will be very hard to uh, hard to join, uh, so, sort of. Um, so Ukraine is crucial because because uh, b because Belarus is basically under control already. Specifically, on, after after what happened up, uh, after last uh, presidential election and uh, Lukashenko turning into uh, into uh, uh, sort of. Uh, um, into a full, full, full-scale tyranny um, at, at at home, 
in, 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 in Belarus. So Belarus is basically under control. Belarus basically might be the ground from which the invasion also could take place, as we, as we know uh, uh, already. Uh, the um, Russian, uh, the uh, former Soviet uh, South is uh, also very uh, dependent from, from, uh, from Moscow. And you probably know that uh, uh, not that long ago, in, in January, Russian forces actually entered Kazakhstan uh, um, and uh, also showed the, well, again, it was not in, uh, technically an invasion, but um, it was uh, the show of force um, that uh, the region certainly, um, certainly understood. So it's not, it's, it's not, about, it's not about annexing uh, U Ukraine like how Crimea was annexed. It's, it, it would be different and it's different in, in, in Putin's mind, but it's uh, about bringing Ukraine back. And what is also important to understand that uh, Vladimir Putin lives in, isol in total isolation for already for uh, almost two years already. Uh, so his, uh, um, his mindset he has, um, is, is, is drifting away from reality. And uh, he, uh, he already explained in his article this, uh, this summer that uh, how he sees the, um, the, this possible invasion, invasion can be backed ideologically by uh, his article that he has written this summer in which he explains that uh, Russians and Ukrainians are one large Russian nation, uh, but Ukrainian part of it is under external rule. That's basically what's written in, um, in, plain, in, in plain text. So he sees his mission uh, and he can actually believe in it, that he has to liberate uh, Russia, Ukrainian part of Russian nation from this, um, this um, enemy's uh, rule under which it is, it is now in form of Zelensky's government. Uh, thank you, Mikhail. Um, we have several questions and which I will address to um, Lena that maybe other participants would also like to answer this question because several people, including Tony Singleton and uh, also I'm just looking who else, Sam Harshberger and um, others. Yes, and there was the same question from Devon Oper comparing the situation in Ukraine with the situation in Nasseria. So the, certainly the, the peril between the current war uh, in Eastern Europe and the, the 2008 invasion, um, the war with uh, Georgia coming to mind. So maybe, uh, uh, Liana, in very general term, uh, from humanitarian economic point of view, um, do you think there is any similarities between like uh, these, these two stories um, or maybe in political, terms as well. There's also a question uh, about the economic and social conditions in this, in the uh, DNR and uh, the Donetsk and Lugansk republics. Sure. Um, so, I mean, uh, the, the war in Georgia is, is typically, um, you know, kind of given as, as the closest analogy, uh, right, to how um, in Russia could potentially execute um, a, a military operation in, in pursuit of its political objectives, um, I, I don't necessarily think that it, it, it's going to be quite the same uh, type of an offensive. Uh, but I think, you know, all things considered, uh, that is probably the closest analogy. Um, th that to me, the main takeaway from, uh, from that particular engagement in 2008 is that Russia doesn't hesitate to use military force, including its conventional army, uh, to achieve its political objectives. Um, in support of you know, breakaway republic, so to speak, um, or to prevent Georgia from pursuing this westward orientation the same way that Ukraine is. But I think things have definitely obviously evolved. The Russian army is not the same army. You know, the Russian military force has undergone a tremendous amount of modernization. So has Ukraine's. But I think that you know, the correlation of forces remains to be um, uh, in Russia's favor, obviously. Uh, so this is not at all about, uh, you know, uh, military balance or how the capabilities match up. Um, I think what's important, the, the main takeaway from uh, the Georgia offensive is that Russia does not hesitate to use force 
uh, to achieve political objectives. Um, and I think that there's a lot of uh, hesitation in conversations about whether you know, Putin um, is too costly, whether he would in fact reconsider this and, and um, you know, whether he's risk averse. And I think that most people have by now determined that um, everything um, in the past 20 years has pointed to the fact that uh, Putin is not as risk averse as he sometimes uh, perceived to be and, and that, that he will not hesitate to use force at uh, whatever cost. And I think he's prepared to absorb the costs for a large scale uh, operation in, in Ukraine to prevent it from um, you know, this geopolitical trajectory that it's on, um, to derail it from uh, this westward orientation. Because from in my opinion, from, from, from his point of view, the, uh, the gain outweighs the cost. Um, and he, what he has shown uh, in the past few years is that he is ready to pay for Ukraine um, more so than the West, that it is more important to him and then he, he will absorb the cost um, if, if it comes down to it. I think uh, like what Atlanta just said is totally spot on. I, I think one thing too, um, just you know, from the more military <laughs> uh, perspective, uh, just like purely like on a sort of a, a tactical level, you know, the, the Georgia war uh, was a was an opportunity for Russia to experiment with sort of its first uses of cyber attacks in a conflict. But those that cyber component was kind of an ancillary part of the, the, the war in Georgia in 2008. I think this time you're going to see cyber attacks uh, taking the place of some of the traditional uses of air power, right? Like shutting down utilities, dealing with communications. I think that, you know, when this starts, we're going to lose cell phones over here. We're going to lose internet probably right off the bat. Uh, the Russian electronic warfare uh, capability is just, you know, off the charts. Their communications are going to be a nightmare for the Ukrainians. I just wrote a story about the Ukrainians. They're now preparing to use like World War II style landline communications to communicate with each other. They're practicing using motorcycle couriers to deliver messages, just assuming that every communication tool they're going to have is going to be unavailable, including and even the tools like GPS will probably be switched off by the Russian side. So I think you know, we saw some of that, like Elena said, like, you know, the Russian military is a far different beast than it was back in 2008. And I think that the cyber and electronic warfare side of this is going to be something totally Kind of game changing, and I think this is, you know, like that, like Desert Storm showed the world the power of the U.S. military. I think this could be, you know, you don't want to ascribe too much psycho psychological analysis to Putin, but I think that this could be a chance for him to show the world, especially with half the journalists on planet Earth here in Kiev right now, to show the world how powerful the Russian military is and how perhaps their ability to accomplish a lot of these military objectives with cyber and electronic warfare assets. So I think this is going to be, if it happens, and God forbid it does, but if it does happen, uh, this will, I think, be a statement about what the Russian military is capable of achieving. Okay, thank you. So I will, you know, we'll, <laughs> we still have a, a lot of questions and I'll ask again, people just pause very quickly, but I will want, you know, I have a list. I have a question to ask from other people, but I'll totally abuse my sort of position as a co-organizer. I, I wanted to ask, you know, and I should probably know that, but I don't. So whoever knows, whoever has an answer is Nolan or maybe Elena. So what's kind of, what's the realistically, how many people can Ukraine deploy in a sort of, in, you know, within a week, so to speak, and how many people, what the size of the armies or what the, what the size of two armies that, that can be deployed on both sides, right? Um, at least, you know, at least very broadly, right? And then, and then, and then I will ask, this is, I think this is a technical question. And then I'll ask, I'd like to ask also questions to Nolan and maybe also whoever can take it. Um, one question is from Katarina Hovnanyan. Would CSTO like Kazakhstan, Armenia, Belarus members back Russian invasion and join the fight against the West? Thank you. So I'll, I'll, I'll take the manpower, then I'll, I'll okay. pivot to the more, you know, <laughs> the, the more, much more prestigious experts than myself on, on uh, more Russia-centric questions. Um, yeah, in Ukraine, regular armed forces, about 250,000 active duty. Eh, that's stated. I think 200,000 is probably, I think 250,000 in total, but I think 50,000 of those are like 
you know, office workers and whatnot. It's about 200,000 that are like, you know, actually combat ready. The territorial defense forces, you know, they've existed for a while, but they're now just sort of getting spun up. The goal is 130,000 across all of Ukraine. You know, and, and it's not, you know, we're like when we, a week or two away from this thing happening. I don't think there's any time for that manpower um, goal to be reached. I did say, like I said earlier, there are about 430,000 veterans of the war in the Donbass, and many of them belong to the first operational reserve. Like I said, they can be mobilized from 20, within 24 hours, and they're basically like plug and play. I mean, these, many of these men and women, you know, extensive combat experience, and they can just basically be thrown into an active duty unit, their old units in most cases, overnight, and be put out uh, on the front lines. But again, you know, if we're looking at like at a major air attack and the, a swift ground invasion, Ukraine hasn't mobilized yet. And I don't think they're going to be able to mobilize those reserve forces in time. And then like the long term build up of these territorial defense forces, it's there's just not enough time to get those things together. So I think that the active duty military on the field right now is probably the fighting force that's available. Um, you know, just looking realistically at how fast this war will, this wider reinvasion will play out. Um, it's going to be really hard for Ukraine to tap into its manpower reserves. Again, as part of the new resistance law that went into Ukraine, went into effect on January 1st, there's the territorial defense force units and there's resistance units. Uh, the resistance units are like clandestine, you know, in theory, like sleeper cells are going to be commanded by Ukrainian special operations forces. And those would be the units that really wage sort of a, a very bona fide like guerrilla war behind the front lines uh, of a Russian occupation. But then again, you know, insurgencies take a long time to spin up too. So if Russia comes in really hard, accomplishes their objective, and then pulls out a few weeks later, there's not going to be enough time really for an insurgency to take root and to inflict a lot of damage on the Russians. So um, yeah, Ukraine has a lot of manpower reserve potential. Again, I think sort of the, the takeaway point is that there may not be enough time for them to tap into that um, when things happen. I think from my perspective, a real Achilles heel, however, in the Ukrainian forces is their air power component. You know, it's just a complete overmatch with Russia. Uh, air defenses are really not up, not capable of repelling the Russian threat. And then, and I cannot stress this enough, but you know, the missile threat from Russia is very extensive. And I, I really worry that, you know, basically in the opening hours of this thing, uh, the Ukrainian forces are going to take some heavy casualties in the Donbass. Remember, there's been a trench war now since February 2015 after Minsk II. The front lines have barely budged. Russia knows exactly where the Ukrainians are. I'm talking to those troops out every day on the front lines. They're not moving around. They're not dispersing. They're not taking uh, precautions against airstrikes. So I, I'm really concerned that, um, you know, that initial air power campaign has the potential to really do some damage uh, in the opening stages of this conflict. Um, thank you. Mikhail, I'm gonna address uh, several questions to you, like combining. One is a question from Thomas uh, Keenan, and there is a question Bradley Woodworth that is somewhat um, similar. And they all address the problem of um, costs uh, for Putin, the domestic costs of, of the invasion, because first of all, the, the, the would be casualties and among the causes will be people who are, uh, have relatives and, and there are uh, two, like many Russians, there. so the, this, the two countries are so too close to each other. Uh, and just to elaborate on that, uh, Bradley Woodruff is asking um, if a wide scale invasion uh, takes place, what kind of domestic consequences could Putin regime face within the Russian Federation? So the the political costs, possible co right. political costs for the, Putin. The, the, these are very, uh, yeah, these are very good questions that I'm not sure I have answers to, but uh, I, um, uh, but um, um, uh, costs and, and, and risks and, uh, um, to, to, to make this clear, as I think, uh, what might be going on in his head, because it's all in his head. That's the, that's the major problem. Um, uh, it, that he definitely um, was prepared. He's definitely. It looks like he's not bluffing with his uh, with his build up. So that means that he 
was or still is ready for uh, some kind of uh, military action. Uh, but uh, he has, as, as Alona mentioned already, he has been known as a cautious, careful uh, political type of person. Uh, so he definitely would be calculating the risks. And, um, and uh, so he should be uh, contemplating what this major invasion uh, would turn into politically uh, for him, uh, for Russia and domestically at home. And uh, he, uh, he might be, um, that would, could possibly stop him, that he understands that um, the array of uh, uh, strongest sanctions, which most likely are turning, will be turning Russia into uh, Iran, some kind of Iran or some, some, something, like, something like that, and uh, also the West being more or less uh, unanimously behind uh, Ukraine because he was that looks like he was counting on this kind of division as he as he always um, was counting um, for uh, and during recent years would be under under Trump uh, in in America or even before 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 that his always his game is to try to divide uh, the West. So he still probably counts on differences between Europe and, uh, and, and America, but it looks like we don't know. Uh, we don't know what uh, Scholz from Germany will be coming to Moscow in a in, uh, in, in few days, and we will probably, probably know more. But these are risks that he, uh, he should be calculating in his head. And uh, uh, what if this, uh, the major, international crisis and the major war that it could turn into and would turn into would mean for himself and his personal future that's it, and his personal rule in, in Russia would be the major question I would be asking myself if I would be him. So that what actually might, uh, uh, might stop him from taking action. What, uh, what he's counting on, um, the other part of it is that he, uh, again, the problem is that uh, we don't know how far from, uh, from reality he is, at, at, uh, in, in, in fact, how he sees what is going on. His picture might be very different from what we understand. He uh, might actually believe that Ukrainians will be welcoming Russian troops, specifically in, in, in the East. He might be believing in it. Uh, and he know he remembers he has this experience of so-called Crimea consensus, which is uh, how it's called in Russia. When basically in two weeks in March uh, 2015, uh, the, um, the his own uh, support, his own approval rating um, um, uh, grew by 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 10, 20, 20 percent, and became like from sixty five to to eighty five in two weeks, and the and he received national support basically from for what happened in uh, in early spring 2000, uh, 2015 when Russia took Crimea back where uh, where, where it belongs, uh, and uh, and and he enjoyed the sort of new uh, level of, uh, of, of, um, uh, of popularity of, of his own authority uh, uh, at home. And he might be aiming, aiming at that again. Of course, if uh, basically a Russian, uh, Russian nation sees uh, what's going on as, uh, as uh, Western aggression, as, as aggression of the West, that's how propaganda shapes it, though not so uh, so strongly these days, these uh, last couple of weeks as before, that's also might be might be important. It doesn't mean anything, but still still important to understand to 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 sort of um, uh, to to get. Uh, and the, so the certainly in in case of war, there certainly will be some kind of mobilization around uh, Putin. We are under attack. This kind of this kind of uh, um, of understanding, um, but it, everyone I know is positive that nothing like Crimean consensus will ever happen. And, 
there were not so many uh, Russian casualties during the Donbass war in 2015, though, though they were, and they, and they were suppressed by Russian propaganda and, and, and censorship, the information about them. In the case of the major war, it will be very hard to uh, very hard to uh, to do. So the the uh, so the situation will be very different from what it was. Again, the question, the major question is, um, how do they see it in the Kremlin? Uh, those around Putin and him personally, does he understand that? Uh, can I just very quickly follow up, Mikhail? Uh, Harold, J Harold James is asking, is it possible that they're uh, invading Russian soldiers if it happens uh, on the ground when they get in contact with Ukrainian population get demoralized? So it's a question about the morale of, of, of Russian army. Um, do, you think, do you think that there is the same kind of commitment will be among Russian soldiers once they like I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. I don't know what, uh, uh, what's, uh, what is the mood um, in, uh, amongst uh, Russian, Ru Russian troops. I know they were, uh, it, was, it was an order to deliver to everyone uh, his, uh, his article I was, I was talking about. That so, uh, so this kind of uh, indoctrination that they would be uh, liberators of um, of their their brothers Russians from uh, from 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 fascist na na almost Nazi na na Nazi rule sort of sort of that's how propaganda shaped it for for, for years but we honestly we, we don't know how it's gonna be and play on the on on the ground in in reality it's too hard to answer okay thank you and I will take um combine two questions to Olena, uh, and it's about like diplomacy or non-diplomacy. And one is from Katerina Khovnanyan. Uh, would countries like Kazakhstan, Armenia, Belarus <clears throat> back Russian invasion? And then a question which is related but different from Sam um, Harshberger, uh, <clears throat> is how effective is, uh, nor can uh, the Normandy format be moving forward? And is there an, alter an alternative to Minsk, to the Minsk agreement? Um, yeah, I mean, those are great questions. Um, I, I, I think that on the question of Belarus, I, I think it's pretty clear. And Mikhail spoke very eloquently to the status of Belarus currently as being pretty much in, in uh, complete control of, of Russia's. And, you know, they're, they're uh, an extension of Russia's armed force, military power too. Um, so I, I think, um, uh, you know, Belarus is probably a more predictable case here in terms of how um, you know they're they're likely to position themselves. And the rhetoric coming out of, of Minsk has been very different, um, not very diplomatic. Um, in terms of uh, Minsk's Normandy format, you know they they have a meeting tomorrow. Um, I think that the, at this point, um, you know nothing says lack of progress like um, <laughs> ventilating Minsk II uh, uh, agreement. Uh, and um, I, I think that um, it is mainly these negotiations are uh, still taking the Normandy format is still intact. I, in my opinion, mainly as a way to stall for time because I think stalemate is beneficial to Zelensky right now. He he is completely cornered. You know, there are no good options. Um, he is between the rock and the hard place. So anything that buys him time um, is 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 a good dynamic right now. But by and large. Minsk II um, is is not is an is a non-starter for Ukraine. You know, it was signed um, in 2015. Poroshenko signed it at gunpoint uh, when uh, the Ukrainian forces were being slaughtered in the Batseve. So he was forced to the negotiating table and signed this agreement in a rush um, that was by design uh, a non-starter because it it, it Minsk II uh, is self-contradictory, has irreconcilable positions on the order in which. Um, it is to be implemented, um, and I, I just don't see how, um, you know, Zelensky is facing basically two options, as I have been saying in social media, too, that, you know, if he, you know, he already flirted with Steinmeier, uh, a Steinmeier formula um, a few years ago, and we all know how that ended, you know, he kind of got a taste of uh, backlash right there uh, when they try to implement uh, Minsk II by allowing elections in the occupied territories while the Russian troops were still there. 
Um, and that didn't end well for, for Zelensky. I think he, he got a preview of, of what an internal turmoil would look like, was uh, literally trying to overthrow the Zelensky uh, presidency for moving any further with, uh, with Minsk II implementation. So Zelensky obviously took a very different direction, a hard turn away from Minsk II um, and uh, increasingly more pro-NATO, uh, pro-EU orientation. And uh, so he's now, and, and that's, I think, it, it is exactly why we're seeing this escalation from Russia is because they don't see any hope in uh, negotiating with Zelensky. Uh, I, I think they're going for uh, uh, political capitulation uh, one way or the other, uh, because there's, Minsk II is, is a non-working um, agreement. And I think it's mainly right now, you know, Macron uh, ventilated it and, and um, the United States in all their official statements continue to emphasizing Minsk II as a, as a, uh, as a working agreement. Um, but I think realistically, what we're seeing is that um, it would be a political suicide for Zelensky to uh, return to Minsk II. Um, and he has uh, you know, signaled a different choice. Um, and, and I think that uh, Putin uh, will, with this new offensive, it's likely that we're, we may see a, a Minsk three of sorts, maybe it will be, um, um, you know, obviously it's not gonna be Minsk, um, maybe it will be Ankara, you know, Turkey now <laughs> offered to, to host talks. Maybe it will be some Ankara in, in agreement uh, that will be much more maximalist in its uh, objectives, um, and it would be much more costly for, for Ukraine. Thank you. So uh, I will take um, two questions for Nalan, um, and they're kind of dissimilar, but they're brief. One question is about, everyone is asking about the Olympic Games. So there is a kind of dependency between 2014 and the Olympic Games now. Uh, do you think that uh, the end of the Olympic Games is, is the, like a, some kind of the, 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 the day when it may start? And another question is, is in a different direction. What would you like the U.S. and NATO to do in, in this given situation? Um, yeah, so for <laughs> the Olympic game question, I think that's actually, um, it's, it's a good good question because a lot of things seem to be lining up on February 20th. I mean, it is the end of the Olympic Games. It's also the end of the announced exercises in Belarus. And I think the news broke maybe one or two days ago that for the first time since uh, 1999, there's not going to be a Russian delegation at the Munich Security Conference from February 18th to 20th. So you just you're starting to see a lot of like, you know, but again, if everybody's thinking one thing, that does give Russia the opportunity mm -hmm. to execute something else too, right? If everybody's expecting it right after the Olympic Games, maybe they do something this weekend, catch everybody off guard. Um, but I think absolutely, I think that, you know, the bottom line is like for the next couple of weeks, three weeks, maybe 30 days maximum, like this is it. This is the danger period. After that time, it's going to be really hard for, for Russia to maintain those, for, those, those forces forward positioned. And also, I think people are going to start to think this is a, a bluff. People are going to start to not take it seriously as this drags on. You're already, I mean, as a journalist who's covering this 24-7, I can say, I'm tired. <laughs> you know, I can only imagine what the troops are feeling on the front lines, what the politicians are feeling. But, but I think as the longer this drags on, people are going to stop taking it seriously and therefore stop taking, you know, Russia's sort of political demands seriously as well, because they're not going to take the military threat uh, as a realistic one. Uh, but yes, I think that whether it's February 20th or, you know, this weekend, the next month, super dangerous moment. And we should be ready. Basically, I, I think about this weekend, things are the buildup will probably, you know, for all intents and purposes, be complete. I think there's probably still more troops coming. But an important thing to note, like, you know, what happened in Kazakhstan recently, it definitely showed that Russia can air airlift troops quite quickly and on a moment's notice. So there's the, you know, the ability to move troops very quickly by air. And also, you know, all those internet researchers are posting pictures every day of train tanks on trains and, you know, MLRS systems on trains and all this stuff. And that's really easy to spot, but the troops are going to be moving toward Ukraine on just normal passenger cars. And so that may be not quite as visible to us when they start sending thousands of more troops to man all that equipment that's been pre-placed. So, um, 
kind of a long meandering answer to the question, but uh, yes, I do think um, uh, without a doubt that uh, the next few weeks are a very dangerous moment and, uh, and that we should probably be ready for something to start uh, anytime. And what was the second question? I'm sorry for about NATO in, in the US. About, yes. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a tricky situation, I think, for a more robust delivery of weapons. Like I said earlier, that it's probably too late for sophisticated air defense technology to make a difference. I mean, it would take years to get the things here and train the Ukrainians and all that. Uh, nonetheless, you know, even if this crisis passes, the Russian threat will remain. For Ukraine in the long term, so it may, you know, why not start sending those systems now to prepare for the next crisis? On the other hand, if you do send those systems now or announce that Patriot missiles are going to Ukraine, that further exacerbates that now or never mindset in Russia, which I think, and I think a lot of other people suspect, could be one driving factor of this, which is the fact that Ukraine's military is getting a lot stronger quite rapidly. And Russia's advantage in the coming years is going to be less and less. And so this could be the most opportune moment for Russia to attack. And by the way, also, you know, when the US and Russia withdrew from the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Range Cruise Missile Treaty, a couple of years ago, that also relieved Ukraine of the burden of not having those medium range uh, missiles uh, from that Cold War era arms treaty. And Ukraine immediately announced the development of new missiles that could theoretically strike St. Petersburg and Moscow. And by the way, you know, the first cruise missile, the Neptune cruise missile uh, unit for Ukraine with some 72 missiles is, in theory, supposed to be ready uh, this year, the next few months. So Ukraine's ability to retaliate against Russia uh, if it is attacked, uh, defensive retali you know, in retaliation for being attacked, uh, is going to significantly increase as time goes on. And so it's tricky for NATO to not feed into this like impetus for Russia to do something quickly by sending more robust uh, military aid. I think we should keep giving Ukraine these like low, you know, for the low tech weapons, like, um, you know, grenade launchers and things like that that they can use immediately on the battlefield, ammunition. Uh, again, that sends a message of solidarity and whatnot. But I think at this point, maybe, I mean, you know, I'm not a diplomatic expert by any stretch, but maybe start having a, a rolling timetable of demands for Russia, like back down in a week, or we, you know, sanction all the oligarchs back down a week after that, or we cut you off. Just say like, you have to deescalate or we're going to start applying sanctions preemptively. And something I say, you know, when I get a little bit emotionally worked up about this is, you know, if you walked up to somebody in the street and you put a gun to their head and said, give me your wallet, you've already committed the crime. You've already threatened violence to get what you want. And that's what Russia has done to Ukraine. And from my perspective, I think we're already at a moment where additional sanctions should be levied. And we should start punishing Russia now uh, in anticipation of the of the, you know a coming attack because they they've clearly signaled an intent to possibly do that. Um, so I guess I think that yeah I think that perhaps now is the time to start the sanctions. But then again, you know, there's a million different what ifs about whether this is going to escalate these things or whatnot. But you know, if Russia has already decided that uh, on military action, uh, maybe at this point we just need to start treating it as sort of a given, perhaps, that this, this wider war is coming. Um, thank you. Well, unfortunately, we run out of time. Although we have, we received more than 40 questions and our apologies to everyone whose uh, question we couldn't ask. Um, just a, a reminder that everything that uh, all, all this uh, event has been recorded and you can return in, in uh, uh, watch it again, it is going to be posted on, on the website, uh, Russian Eurasian uh, East European Program with Princeton. We also have a, a YouTube channel. Um, and so uh, just let me conclude with uh, thanking everyone, especially Mikhail, who is connecting from, from Moscow and Nolan from, from Kiev. And uh, I know it's, it's very late there. Uh, and uh, Alona uh, for the wonderful comments and, and the audience for your uh, great questions.
Ira, you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone too. You know, it's been a, um, for those of us who stayed uh, through the whole discussion, uh, we've had a, a great audience and a great discussion. I think it's been, you know, it's a very successful event, and I really feel for both Noel, I mean, for all of the panelists, you know, for Lena who has a family in Donetsk, you know, for Nolan who has a family in Kiev, right, or somewhere around, you know, and Mikhail who has a family, right. Uh, in, in Russia, you know, and I it just, you know, just would say, you know, at, on, uh, and on a personal note, it feels like Lena told me in a personal conversation a few days ago after after I invited her, she told me, it, this is kind of echoing Nolan's comments, right? It, talking about, is there is a war, not the war? And she said, you know, a war scare is already a war, right? And a lot of us, you know, live in kind of the situation when you wake up at night and check Facebook to see if, if you know, if it's, if it's on or not, right? And it's, it is this kind of, this emergency that, we would like to avoid, let's put it this way, right? All of us would like to avoid. But thank you very much. You know, thank you for Katya Pravilova and the center and, you know, for, and Carol especially, who is not in, who is uh, invisible, but who is very much present. Uh, and for just and everyone who just who, who, who are here with us for this one and a half hour. Thank you very much. Thank you. And stay tuned for all other events. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night.